Good afternoon. Welcome to the first meeting of the newly reconfigured Indiana Reinvestment Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council. My name is Chris Goff, and I serve as an Associate Justice on the Indiana Supreme Court. I have been designated by Chief Justice Loretta Rush to serve as chair of JRAC. I wanna thank uh, Chief Justice Rush for the opportunity to serve uh, among uh, such highly credentialed and uh, experienced public servants. Later in our meeting, all members of JRAC will have an opportunity to introduce themselves and share some information uh, that their representative agencies or organizations are working on uh, that are of common interest to members of JRAC. Uh, as we begin our meeting today, I want to take just a moment to uh, explain briefly the duties of JRAC and the purpose of JRAC. The duties of uh, the Indiana Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council include, one, reviewing and evaluating state and local criminal justice systems and corrections programs, including pretrial services, behavioral health treatment, and recovery services, community corrections, county jails, parole, and probation services. Two, reviewing the processes used by the Department of Correction and the Division of Mental Health and Addiction in awarding grants. Three, reviewing and evaluating jail overcrowding to identify a range of possible solutions. Four, coordinating with other criminal justice funding sources. Five, establishing committees to inform the work of the Advisory Council, and six, performing other relevant duties as determined by the Advisory Council. The purpose of the Advisory Council is to review policies, promote state and local collaboration, and provide assistance for use of evidence-based practices and best practices in community-based alternatives and recidivism reduction programs. Those include, probation services, problem solving courts, mental health and addiction treatment and recovery services, pretrial diversion programs, community corrections, evidence-based recidivism reduction programs for currently incarcerated persons, other rehabilitation alternatives, and the incorporation of evidence-based decision-making into decisions concerning jail overcrowding. Members of the commission, with these duties in and the council, with these duties in mind and purposes in mind, I pause to ask you to reflect on both the gravity of our service and the moment in which we serve. And as we hear from each other today, I hope you agree with me when I say this council is uniquely suited to help Indiana meet this moment. Moreover, as we begin our continuing conversation, I hope you will join me and finding common ground on issues that could improve the lives of Hoosiers today. But I also hope you will join me in finding common ground on issues that could improve the structure of our system for generations to come. I am humbled to serve with each of you. Prior to today's meeting, all council members received a copy of the meeting minutes from the last uh, meeting of the uh, old or initial JRAC, and that meeting was held in December of 2019. I'd first uh, ask whether or not members of the council have any changes or corrections that they think need to be made to the December 2019 uh, meeting minutes. If there are no questions, I'd ask uh, if there's anything that needs to be discussed uh, regarding those minutes. And hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the December 2019 meeting. So moved, Bernice Corley. Seconded, seconded Adam McQueen. Thank you, uh, Ms. Corley. Thank you, Mr. McQueen. We have a motion and a second uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing those, all those in favor of approving the December 2019 minutes, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are approved as presented. 
Before we hear from uh, council members, uh, as I indicated before, this is the first meeting of the newly reconfigured Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council. But JRAC, as originally created, uh, has a history in Indiana, and it is uh, closely related to criminal justice reform uh, initiatives that took place in 2014. And so as we begin our conversation, uh, we, we think it's fitting to uh, spend some time going over the history of JRAC. And for a presentation of that history, I'm now going to turn uh, the meeting over to uh, Jenny Bauer from the Office of Court Services. Ms. Bauer. Thank you, Justice Goff. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the staff attorneys with the Office of Court Services and I serve as the official secretary for JRAC. There we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, this brief history of JRAC is meant to be an introduction for the new members and refresher for the original members. Oops, here we go. So Justice Goff just mentioned some of this, but um, JRAC was established by the General Assembly in 2015. Uh, it started out with nine members representing leadership from the executive and judicial branches of state and local government. And then the state budget director was added in 2019. So JRAC started with two purposes. The first was review and evaluate local corrections programs. And as part of this review, JRAC recommended collaboration between local and local criminal justice stakeholders to share resources, avoid duplication of services, and de develop a county vision of uh, community supervision. The second purpose is review and evaluate the grant processes of the Department of Correction and the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Since fiscal year 16, JRAC has approved $100 million for community supervision grants. These grants helped local agencies expand their programs and hire staff to serve level six felons with priority for pretrial services. JRAC also oversees DMHA's Recovery Works Program. And since fiscal year 16, DMHA has enrolled over 54,000 unique criminal justice involved participants and expended over $70 million in participant services. JRAC has two standing committees, one for data and one for legislation. The data committee signed an MOU with the Management Performance Hub and partnered with the Sheriff's Association in July of 2017 to conduct a jail population survey. And the legislation committee testified before House and Senate committees about the implementation of sentencing reform and the effects on county jails and local corrections programs. The committee also drafted amendments regarding data collection Level six commitments to DOC, Recovery Works misdemeanor pilot, Recovery Works services for juveniles waived to adult court, and rehabilitation progress and recidivism reporting. JRAC has significant overlap with the evidence based decision making initiative. All JRAC members serve on the EBDM state policy team. A little history on EBDM. Indiana was selected for EBDM in 2015, operating in parallel with JRAC. The EBDM purpose is to promote data-driven criminal justice decisions to create a healthier, safer Indiana. The EBDM change targets are data, pretrial release, professional development, mental health, and risk reduction. In 2016, JRAC signed another MOU with the EBDM state team to coordinate efforts on legislation, data, and communication. The General Assembly amended the JRAC statute effective March 14th, adding jail overcrowding and EBDM initiatives to JRAC statutory duties. JRAC membership now includes the Association of Indiana Counties, the Indiana Judges Association, the Public Defender Commission, 
the Senate Corrections and Criminal Law Committee, that's the um, ranking member and ranking minority member, and then the House Courts and Criminal Code Committee, also ranking member and ranking minority member, and the governor's office. The 2020 amendments also named the Chief Justice or her, design, or her designee as chair. So with these expanded duties, JRAC now has six official duties. Um, the two original purposes that I mentioned earlier and review of jail overcrowding, criminal justice funding, additional JRAC committees and other duties as determined by the council. And I also wanted to point out that JRAC submits an annual report to the governor, the legislative council and the chief justice. And since 2018, JRAC partnered with the Criminal Justice Institute on this report, which is available on the JRAC website. That's uh, also where the, the link for the live stream is today for this meeting. And so with that brief history, welcome to the new and improved JRAC, and I look forward to meeting all of you in person. Thanks, Justice Goff. Thank you, Jenny. At this time, I would like to uh, invite members of the uh, council to uh, introduce themselves and to give reports uh, from each of their agencies or organizations uh, concerning items that might be of mutual concern uh, to members of JRAC. As I indicated in um, the letter that I sent to each of you earlier this week, I'm going to call on members uh, in the order in which their agency appears in the JRAC statute. I first call on uh, Bernice Corley, Executive Director, Indiana Public Defender Council. Good afternoon, Ms. Corley. Good afternoon, Justice Goff. Is, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to start, just thank you, Justice Goff, for the introduction and the welcoming table. Thank you to the staff at Court Services. You're so incredibly hardworking and um, you make us more effective. So really appreciate you. Um, also welcome to the new members. I personally look forward to working with each of you. And if there's anything ever that I can do or anything comes up that, or something I say that you'd like me to expound on later, please reach out. Let's develop a, a deeper and growing relationship as we all work on this great work together. Um, with respect to the work of the council, um, I'll focus on more recent uh, activities that we've been working on in light of COVID um, and the change in court procedures, et cetera. The, the council has been working very diligently to train our attorneys so that they're prepared for uh, the change structure um, with hearings, uh, with accessing clients who are incarcerated in jails and being able to communicate with them. So there's been a lot of just um, constituency work with our members in the counties and making sure that in light of COVID, people are able to access our clients and prepare appear safely in court when that's needed or uh, virtually as well. Um, another matter that we've been working on is in light of um, the protests that have been happening in light of uh, George Floyd's death, uh, we have been fielding phone calls from the public as well as other stakeholders. And I've really been uh, sharing some of the efforts that have been made with leadership in Indiana. I wanna start by thanking Chief Justice Rush. I know she's, she's not here, but she released a wonderful statement on uh, race and equity. And I wanna direct everybody, if you haven't seen it, please look at it. Uh, the Chief Justice directs courts to tackle many issues and remind courts that they can be part of the solution in, in tackling race and equity issues. In particular, she points out that the courts can be part of ensuring fairness um, and, and justice and to bring those that stoke fires of, of, of racism and hatred to account. And I think as you read it, everyone on JRAC should also take that charge personally that in all of our works as we do our work, as we touch the criminal justice system, that we should be doing the same. Um, I do want to point out, and I, this isn't quite on topic, uh, Justice Goff, so pardon me, but there was a letter that came out from uh, the Black Caucus calling on a group uh, to be created to study inequities in the criminal justice system. And, uh, and I think, in my opinion, that's JRAC. 
So if, if those discussions move forward, I mean, this is the table. I think we have all the right stakeholders. We have all the right people to come around and address the issues of inequity. And, and I think we can all work together to, to examine where there is inequity and, and tear those instruments down and make a more equitable system. So with that, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Bernice, thank you as always for uh, your comments, your thoughts. They're very welcome, and uh, we appreciate your your expertise and your participation in the meeting today. So, um, members know as we go through um, this initial solicitation uh, for for uh, information and, and items of common concern, the staff at the Office of Court Services is uh, cataloging responses and trying to get uh, an idea of next steps as we move forward in our agenda uh, in the coming months. And I, I really uh, welcome your suggestion, uh, Bernice. I think that that's a, it's a, it's a very important topic. Thank you. I next call on Chris Naylor, Executive Director, Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Thank you, Justice Goff, uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's good to see everyone and I'd like to to welcome the new members uh, and also want to you know give a hat tip to those who've come before us uh, in this collaborative effort including uh, justice david who previously served as a co-chair uh, with dave powell the, of ipac and also larry landis of the public defenders council uh, it's been a really good spirit of teamwork uh, you know criminal justice the system it is a it's a big enterprise and, and each of us uh, on this committee uh, have our spheres of influence and uh, in that regard of this enterprise, we're all on the same team. And uh, it's, this has been very effective because it is an adversarial system, uh, yet we managed to do our work in a non-adversarial way. So uh, I just uh, am just happy to be a part of this committee. Uh, and, and Bernice, I, I do echo uh, your sentiments uh, in terms of the uh, Black Legislative Caucus's call to uh, look at inequities in the system. And I agree with you, Bernice, that JRAC yeah, is the place to have those discussions and take uh, action steps uh, where needed. Uh, you know, in terms of 2020, uh, what prosecutors have been working on what with the courts and with public defenders, uh, you know, we've had expansion of remote proceedings and many on this call, uh, probation, community correction, sheriff included. Uh, the court's taken great leadership uh, in expand in allowing for expanded remote proceedings, and uh, that seems to be working well. When remote proceeding can be held, they're they're being held that way for the safety of uh, participants, witnesses, and court staff. Uh, we've also uh, had collaborative discussions on how do we turn to uh, semi-normal operations of courts, and there's been lots of good collaborative work, sharing of ideas on looking at CDC and OSHA guidance and uh, how do we make our community safe and uh, interestingly our jurors safe uh, when it comes time to have jury trials again. So there's been a lot of really good uh, ongoing efforts to, to figure out how to uh, take these next steps uh, during just this, this strange time. Uh, you know, in terms of some uh, specifics, uh, you know, I thought I would share some uh, some stats, and I don't want to, to steal uh, any thunder from the Sheriff's Association in, in terms of uh, our, our jail uh, statistics and the number of people in Indiana jails. Uh, but during the COVID, during March, April, May, uh, the, the number of uh, people in Indiana jails typically is around 19,000. Uh, during this time period, that number has come down to 15,000, roughly. Uh, but I just I want to thank the, the judges, uh, prosecutors, uh, public defenders who work together on these issues uh, with pretrial release decisions, resolution of cases. And uh, I just think we are so fortunate that Criminal Rule 26 provided a really good uh, framework uh, to, to address uh, the issue and look for solutions. Uh, so really a, another I just want to applaud the efforts uh, to, to try to provide for safe communities. Uh, in, in connection with that, uh, I just report out that in terms of the number of, of charges filed, we uh, our case management system uh, can track that. And we we looked at April 2020 versus April uh, 2019, uh, May 2020 versus May 2019. And overall, the number of uh, charges filed, which are 
you know, driven largely by arrests, uh, it, they're down about 30 to 40 percent uh, across the board, uh, with the exception of, of murder and uh, level one felonies, which are the nine most uh, serious felony offenses, which both of those categories are up a little bit. So just to give some uh, some context of, of where we've been the last three months, uh, some specific things that prosecutors have been working with with our justice partners, uh, uh, which you know could be connected to JRAC, uh, but the the uh, Indiana Innovation Initiative uh, is looking for ways uh, to make improvements in the justice system. And one of the things that we've talked about specifically are uh, misdemeanor diversions, and uh, there are opportunities to. Uh, initiate diversions uh, with defendants early in the process, very early in the process, in fact, before uh, they are appointed counsel. Uh, and these would be misdemeanors uh, that don't include uh, uh, driving while intoxicated or battery, but just uh, uh, minor nonviolent offenses where uh, the prosecutor could work with a pe the person accused and enter into an, a diversion agreement, uh, which ultimately would lead to the dismissal of the case. And in tracking those numbers, uh, that's the potential for up to 15,000 cases each year, uh, which could be streamlined, which would reduce the amount of contact with, with the justice system uh, for those sorts of offenses. Uh, uh, IPAC's also working on a, a felony diversion pilot, pilot program, and we've been sidetracked a little bit with uh, pandemic, but uh, we, uh, and that's, that's, those are for felonies. Uh, and so there's still some work to do, but uh, we want to expand the use of diversion in Indiana. Uh, those were uh, the highlights for me, uh, Justice. Uh, again, it's good to, to see everybody on screen today. Well, Chris, it's good to see you. And uh, for the benefit of the other members and, and folks who might be joining the meeting uh, via live stream, throughout the course of the pandemic, uh, Bernice and Chris have both participated in regular justice stakeholder calls with a, a variety, wide variety of state and local uh, justice stakeholders to really just kind of compare notes on how things changed during that period of time. And uh, we were just really extraordinarily pleased to see the way in which communities came together and, and really right-sized their jails in a very short period of time. And uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for your participation and Bernice's uh, in, in uh, Kind of shepherding your constituent groups through that. So thank you. It's, it's good to see you. I'm next going to call on uh, Ms. Rebecca Buner, who is uh, designated to participate in today's meeting by Jay Chaudhry as Executive Director of the Indiana Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Ms. Buner. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Justice Goff. Um, so I'm excited today to talk to you about um, Recovery Works, as well as a new program that is starting around competency restoration. I think there's um, a handout. Oh, are we doing Recovery Works first? Okay, we'll do, sorry, swap. We'll do Recovery Works first. Um, so um, many of you are familiar, have seen this um, handout before, and really it just kind of goes through over this past month. And so this is just May data. Um, on what we did. And um, like many other folks due to COVID, we were not able to get out and do any site visits um, in the month of May and or April previous um, to um, COVID. Um, we really are starting to um, flip and do most of our trainings virtually and that has been well received. So we have been able to continue our trainings and then also um, do a lot of uh, connections with providers that are just more one-on-one -on -one or through teams and those kinds of things to make sure they're staying up to date on our policy changes. Um, the quality improvement, the 14 audits that we've conducted so far this year, these, these trends have not changed. Um, as you look to the bottom, looking at the numbers uh, for state fiscal year 2020, as you can tell, that number is significantly down um, compared to where we have been in the past. And what we have found is in the month of March, we added just a couple hundred. And then in the month of April, it was a couple hundred. Um, and then actually in the month of May, it was really just 300. And so COVID has really affected our number of enrollment. 
going back to previous years, our average enrollment per month was around 1,200. So that's a significant drop in the number for enrollment. And then our cost so far this year, as many of you um, are aware, and I've spoken at the last JRAC around really our focus with recovery works over this past year has been to get providers so they can build Medicaid as soon as possible and really support our providers in getting individuals, patients, clients connected to Medicaid as soon as possible. And so the good side of that is that we have seen a dr drastic reduction in our spend. Um, this has a lot to do with really making that very focused attention on getting individuals access to Medicaid because that's going to be their long-term sustainability. I will note that a couple of years back, legislation allowed for Recovery Works funding to support the match for Medicaid rehab options. And that is not included in this 9.8 million. That is approximately 1.2 million. We're finalizing that number so far for this year. So we are looking at around 11 million thus far for Recovery Works. And this is through May, um, understanding that individuals do have a couple of weeks later to bill. So I expect this number to go up from May, and then also we will have uh, June. If you could go to the next. Um, as you can see, recovery residents, I've spoken about this before as well. It's really one of our prime areas of focus right now, understanding that individuals need a safe place to live before they can really start on their recovery journey and have success. And so we've made paying for and supporting recovery residents a, a top priority. And so that continues to be one of our top services. So that, that's very exciting to see because that is a priority for us. Um, the top five agencies and counties, this has not fluctuated much since we started uh, Recovery Works. When you look down at residential treatment, we had one consumer that we paid for re, um, residential treatment in the month of May. So this is somewhat due to COVID. In April, we had about 12. I will also say though, with COVID, Medicaid made significant changes to their um, prior authorization allowing individuals to automatically get approval for 21 days instead of 14 days. And oftentimes what we were seeing was our re, um, residential requests for funding were to support continued length of stay. So Medicaid would pay for those first several days and then would stop and then they would look to recovery works to support that. So as a result, I believe of Medicaid really paying for that 21 days, our number of requests for residential treatment has gone down. And again, this is contributing to our lower spend because Medicaid, since the, the SUD waiver picked up, um, it has covered a lot of those costs. Um, if you could go to the next page. Um, so this is, this is new for, um, obviously, since it is COVID related, um, a new handout for us. We just wanted to share with you because of COVID, we really took a look at what were we able to do to support the individuals we're serving through Recovery Works through this really difficult time. And so we made some significant policy changes. One of those um, is re related to recovery residences and recognizing that recovery residences are gonna have individuals staying with them that are not gonna have the ability due to COVID to go out and, and seek employment or even to, to work depending on the, the job that they were they had at the time. Plus there would be extra costs, you know, costs to keep people safe as you know, personal protective equipment and those kinds of things. So we allowed for recovery residents to bill a one-time stipend a month for three months. And so this covered April, May, June. And we had 45 residents take advantage of this for just over $300,000 $300, worth of funding. And we received a lot of positive feedback that this was very helpful so that during this difficult time, the recovery residents were not in, in di more dire shape as a result of COVID. They were able to keep serving individuals and not kick individuals out. Um, we also, going back to jail treatment and um, just recognizing that while individuals are in jail, the facility might not have access to equipment in order to support telehealth. Uh, Medicaid really switched and allowed for a lot of services to go to telehealth. And so as a result, Recovery Works followed in that same line. Um, so we put out a request for 
jails to ask for equipment. And we had nine correctional facilities that took advantage of that. We, um, it was up to $2,500 per facility. And then you can see on there what we were able to purchase um, on behalf of those facilities so that they could continue the mental health and addiction treatment while that individual uh, was still in the jail. And then the discretionary bucket funding, um, we recognize we've been working on a discretionary bucket for a while. And I think just took advantage of the fact that we had COVID and um, the opportunity to really look at some of our policies and make some, some changes. And when folks are coming out of jail or Department of Corrections, they don't always have access to their birth certificates, their social security cards, and these um, one-time expenses that are a, a huge lift sometimes when people are just coming out. And so we started a discretionary fund, $250 per individual that could help them to purchase these items so that they could you know, start looking for a job or apply for Medicaid or some of those things that are needed. And so we had 75, or I'm sorry, 79 individuals through 11 agencies that took advantage of that. Um, and then the next piece that I wanted to talk about um, is a new initiative that we're working on around competency restoration. <clears throat> so I think there's a handout for that. Yeah, there we go. Um, so as we speak about jail overcrowding, um, Director Chaudhry, um, one of his biggest initiatives and priorities as director of Division of Mental Health and Addiction is really looking at that wait list within the jails to help get folks into our state psychiatric hospitals. So just for a frame of reference, today we have 67 individuals in jail on a wait list to get into a state operated facility, state psychiatric hospital, in order to um, get competency restoration. And so we have um, refocused some of our federal block grant money to support two types of competency restoration. One is jail-based, and the other one is community-based. And as you can see, these are not yet started. They are rolling out in August and subsequent in winter of 2020. And we are looking at, um, for the jail-based competency, restor competency restoration, we are looking at Marion County as well as Vandenberg County for this, these two areas. And the local community mental health center in both of those areas will be the partner with the jail and the sheriff um, to really look at getting the services. So those services would be skills training, legal education, uh, medication, and or types of therapy to build that competency back. And so we have the jail base. So that clearly would occur while that person is still incarcerated. And then the community-based restoration program, which will just be in Marion County. And that will be offering the services while that person has been released back to the community. Um, the final piece of this is discharge support. And so a recognition that individuals are being released from our state psychiatric hospitals would potentially be facing homelessness. And so the need to really work with them to find a safe environment, safe place for them to live upon that discharge. And so this is a partnership with the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority that is coming up. So these are three projects, pilots that are coming up here in the next Quarter. So hopefully next time we have JRAC, um, our director will be able to provide a little bit more update on those, those programs. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Uh, Becky, thank you for that very thorough report on the work uh, that's being done by DMHA. I, um, as I go through, I, I hope you'll forgive me, uh, council members. I um, have so many conversations with different stakeholders and I, I'd like to, to the extent that I can, uh, uses this time to sort of tie in uh, some of the work that's being done by different stakeholder groups uh, to, the, to the larger initiatives of the whole. And as to Becky's presentation, I have had on a couple of different occasions the chance to uh, indicate to both Bernice and Chris the need to bring uh, the defense community and the prosecutors into a larger uh, conversation about some reform efforts that are being done in the area of mental health. And uh, there are several members of what uh, I like to call the Deadwood group that are on uh, the call today. Back in October, there were a group of uh, folks from Indiana who were able to attend some training in Deadwood, South Dakota, that was presented by the National Center for State Courts. 
And as a result of that, Indiana was awarded uh, some funds to uh, have their mental health delivery system mapped. And it would be mapped uh, in keeping with the sequential intercept model so that different delivery points within the system could be identified as choke points and uh, areas where funding might make the most difference. As a follow-up to that, uh, several sheriffs and I had an opportunity to visit the Logansport State Hospital and, and really look at some of these issues that uh, you just presented on, Becky, about some of the problems with discharging folks into their communities. And uh, a lot of that had to do with really some uh, disparate service from community mental health providers. And I know that you folks have been doing great work uh, with the community mental health providers and, and increasing capacity. I say all that uh, to, to introduce this. Um, earlier this week, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Representative Greg Stewart, who is particularly interested in this very area. And uh, he wanted to address and ask me to just thank all of the members of JRAC. He was so instrumental uh, in the initial passage of JRAC in, in, in criminal justice reform in Indiana writ large. But he was very happy to hear about all of these initiatives. And I, I hope that you um, and, and some of these other groups, um, Chris, Bernice, and, and some of the original Deadwood group members um, will uh, be willing to serve on, on a group that will really uh, kind of push forward with some of these things that I think have so much potential uh, for, for making things better for, for Hoosiers. So thank you for your, uh, for your hard work. Thank you, uh, Director Chaudhry, for being such a, a wonderful uh, justice partner. I next call on uh, a member of uh, the Indiana Sheriff's Association to make a presentation on behalf of Indiana Sheriffs. I'm not sure that we had anyone call in uh, from the Sheriff's Association, but if there is a sheriff who calls in uh, later in the call uh, and, and staff has the ability to identify them, please let me know so that we can uh, be certain to hear from the sheriffs. and. In the event that doesn't happen, I just want to indicate uh, what, what wonderful partners the sheriffs have been uh, through the pandemic and uh, their, their information that they've been able to assemble with respect to jail data has really helped uh, drive so many of the discussions and kept uh, a lot of people safe and, and kept the courts open for essential functions. So thank you to the sheriffs. Um, I would next then call on uh, Christine Blessinger uh, as the designee of uh, Commissioner Rob Carter from the Indiana Department of Corrections. Okay, thank you, Justice Gall. So, um, as you know, this so this is only my second JRAC meeting, and actually uh, only my first meeting as being the Commissioner Carter's designee or proxy. So I'm really looking forward to being a part of this committee and learning more and more about what um, everyone's doing. Um, also, I'm still fairly new to this position as a whole, so it's great to be a part of this now, definitely to learn more and more. Um, so I'll just give you uh, just a little brief overview. So I'm sure, you know, as you all know, this has been kind of an interesting year for all of us. Um, we've all dealt with some interesting things and challenges. And at this point, we really don't know. Uh, there's still a lot of things that we really don't know what to expect and, um, you know, what to see moving forward. But we're adapting really well to change and we're looking forward to working on how all of our future plans will look. Uh, for everything for our agency. Um, we did release our community corrections grant announcement for fiscal year 2021. Uh, we wanted to get it out in time for the agencies to be able to get their applications in by the July 17th due date. Uh, we are here to help uh, with any questions or anything that anyone needs. So please uh, know that they can. anyone can reach out to us um, Kristen Bonswalk and Liz Darledge are also uh, here to help us. Um, so for our community corrections program audits right now, uh, they are kind of on, are, they're on hold. So, so everyone knows that. Um, we're not sure exactly when we will get them started back up again, but we'll keep everyone posted on that. Uh, through this time, uh, Dr. Doss, our chief medical officer, and our executive team um, have been amazing during this time. Uh, we've not only been, you know, 
doing things and assisting DOC through this process, but we've also been assisting and guiding um, counties and guiding jails and sheriffs and community corrections agencies. Uh, so that's, I think, I mean, Dr. Doss, she's just been amazing. I don't know any of you who, who know her. She's just, oh, she has really, really helped us and guided us. And we've done such a great job, I think, through this, um, uh, through what everyone has, has been dealing with. Um, you know, we continue to monitor all the trends and populations. Uh, you know, as Chris was saying, the jail population is lower. Ours is also uh, lower, and I think many others are, are lower also. Um, you know, really, we just want the community corrections agencies to just take a look at their needs when they're doing their grant applications and prioritize their needs and goals. Um, I think we all have to do that right now. So we're all doing that. Um, you know, as Bernice was saying too, we're also looking at in, um, inequities and we're starting to meet and do uh, things as an agency together. We really want to start, um, we're going to start from the top and we're going to start working down on, on these issues also. Um, really, that's kind of all I had for today, uh, just to kind of get us started on this and looking forward to working more closely with everyone. Chris, thank you so much for the update from the Department of Corrections and your participation as a council member. Uh, we all appreciated uh, Commissioner Carter's leadership and, and communication throughout the course of the pandemic. And we were all nothing short of amazed of the work that Dr. Doss did, uh, not only within the Department of Corrections, but also to provide uh, some clear and consistent guidance to so many communities that are lacking in, in public health infrastructure. So uh, I just want to publicly indicate that that level of collaboration uh, probably saved a lot of people's lives, uh, no doubt did, but uh, above and beyond those folks who um, are in the Department of Corrections. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I next call on Mary Kay Hudson, uh, Executive Director of the Indiana Office of Court Services. Mary Kay. Uh, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, I'm Mary Kay Hudson with Court Services. I'm serving as the designee of our Chief Administrative Officer, Justin Forkner, and I'm happy to be here um, with this group. It's good to see everyone. I have a, a few updates on some of the things that, that have been happening with OJA and the Office of Court Services relative to some of the, the work of JRAC. Um, we have been working with many of you um, on some initiatives regarding assisting courts with um, filing petitions for emergency relief and trial court operations relative to the pandemic. Um, and we appreciate all the support that we've gotten from um, Bernice and Chris and all the agencies um, in assisting us with um, helping giving some guidance to counties uh, during this time, specifically as it relates to some of the, the, the hearing types um, and proceedings and juries and things like that. Um, we've also been assisting counties with adopting their resuming operations uh, petitions under Administrative Rule 17. So um, again, that also relates to the, the way courts are doing business related to community supervision and pretrial and jury juries and things like that. So it's been a really difficult time, but it's been nice to have all the support of our state and local partners on this. Um, related to that, we have issued guidance on the Supreme Court's COVID-19 website about resuming um, operations uh, with community supervision agencies. We've worked specifically with the Department of Correction, IACAC and Popeye and developing some guidance for community supervision. We developed some guidance for problem solving courts that was developed through a survey of all of our statewide problem solving courts. Uh, and we've also given some guidance on remote hearings. And I think generally speaking, courts have adapted really well to the changing conditions of the pandemic. I mean, I think we're looking at what some practices may be able to persist post-pandemic so that we can continue with some of the efficiencies that courts have experienced um, during this time. Um, we've also been assisting counties with implementation of criminal rule 26 and pretrial certification. We have 26 counties who have expressed intent to become pre certified pretrial services agencies. So we're really excited about that. Um, and I think that's also a reflection of the partnerships that we've had at the state and local levels. Um, clearly all of you all are involved in the pretrial initiative. And I think uh, what counties are doing is a reflection of 
what they have been able to learn and glean from the work of the pilot sites and the various trainings that, that we have put together collaboratively. Um, and just being able to, to work with them to be responsive to their concerns and help them problem solve is, is really apparent um, that it's been helping the counties make adjustments. Uh, we're also continuing to work on pretrial research. So we, uh, we have partnerships with researchers who are taking a look at validation of the pretrial tool, um, looking at some supervision outcomes. So we're continuing to do that. I know that's a, that's a significant interest to JRAC um, and its members. So we'll continue to keep you updated on that. Um, and because we have been working closely with JRAC and the evidence-based decision-making initiative, you would expect that JRAC would receive uh, regular reports and be involved in our ongoing work with pretrial. Um, our office has also been providing some funding to local jurisdictions. And a lot of that funding has actually come as a result of our partnerships with you all here at the state level. Um, we are working on the second year of providing grants to counties using the statewide opioid response grants um, that were provided to us from the Division of Mental Health and Addiction, and we're very grateful for that. And then we're also just released um, funding under year two of funding for family recovery courts that has come from the governor's commission and for, from Doug Hunsinger, and um, that was a total of a million dollars last year and a million, years, a million dollars in the upcoming year. So we're very grateful for that. Um, and then we've also been partnering with the Department of Correction uh, as we fund community supervision agencies in pretrial and problem solving courts um, to make sure that we are, our funding source streams are complementing what the De Department of Correction is doing under the Community Corrections Grant Act, Act funds. And so it's really helpful to have those, that communication going in that partnership. Um, our problem solving courts are continuing to grow. It was just a little bit over a year ago where we celebrated our 100th certified problem solving court. And I'm happy to, to report that we now have 111 certified problem solving courts and we have 16 more in the planning stages. So we've had a significant increase. Um, and again, similar to our work with pretrial, all of that comes as a result of our, our commitment and partnerships here at the state and local level across criminal justice agencies. And so thank you for that. Um, in terms of priorities for, for JRAC, um, I think it would be um, really helpful for JRAC to you know, take a look at some of the work that was done last year. And that was both under JRAC's pretrial and bail reform report that was issued in December of 2019, as well as the jail overcrowding task force report that was issued um, also on, on, in December of 2019. Um, I think those two reports provide um, significant and substantive recommendations for this group moving forward. Um, as we know, the, the amendment to the JRAC statutes did incorporate the Jail Overcrowding Task Force mission. And so I think that those two reports provide uh, a pretty strong roadmap for this group looking forward. And some of the issues specifically related to data collection, data sharing, um, behavioral health needs, community supervision needs, um, and I think though some of the priorities that are listed in those reports would be um, a good starting point for the, for the new uh, JREC membership to look at. And Justice Goff, that's all I have. Mary Kay, thank you for uh, your excellent report and everything that you do for Indiana. Uh, in my prior life, just uh, less than three years ago, I was a trial judge in, in a, a rural part of Indiana. And I can tell you from that position, the Indiana Office of Court Services is really a very effective way to uh, give access to the very best parts of our justice system, no matter who you are, no matter where you're at. And that would not be possible without Mary Kay and, and her fine staff at the Indiana Office of Court Services. So thank you very much. Um, I, I wanna go back and give uh, any of the staff an opportunity if uh, Steve Luce from the Sheriff's Association is on. I, I'm told he was trying to join earlier. I wanna give him an opportunity to speak uh, if, if he's on. Are you on, Steve? Okay. Justice Goff, this is Jenny. I think he's still having trouble getting in. We're working with him behind the scenes. We'll let you know when we get him in. Okay, very well. Thank you, Jenny. Well, in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and continue uh, along the, the list as it appears in the statute and ask for, uh, I just found out as my new neighbor, uh, Devin McDonald of the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me okay? 
We can hear you, Devin. Yes, okay, thank you. Great. Uh, again, my name is Devin McDonald. I'm the executive director here at the Criminal Justice Institute. Um, yeah, I don't have too much to report on, but in, in um, I guess we'll start off with kind of the COVID response. So one of our main efforts here recently was we received a grant through the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and many of you have I've spoken to many of you here on the, the council about that uh, as well. But uh, one of our focuses is trying to get that money out to the locals. And uh, we have received a handful of applications to do everything from uh, for video monitoring equipment to um, cell phones, laptops, whatnot, for uh, local officers to do, you know, whether it be probation, community corrections, or law enforcement officers to do the monitoring and, and the jobs that they need to do for those folks that are out in the community. So we're looking forward to continue that. We've also partnered with uh, DOC for some funding uh, for their COVID response uh, and looking to uh, work with a couple other agencies here at the state level uh, to help uh, expand um, their abilities to work through COVID response as the courts slowly reopen and uh, folks are in the community. Um, I've also been working or trying to since uh, the end of the session uh, with um, the Sheriff's Association. Uh, as many of you know, House Bill 1346 passed, which requires the Criminal Justice Institute to work with the sheriffs and collect uh, jail data and make that available. So uh, we've got, had some preliminary conversations on how to do that, um, looking to some uh, pilot a few counties to see how we can do that data transfer and get that moving forward as well. Um, that'll help greatly with another project that we've been working on with the Sheriff's Association and DOC as well to compile um, jail data and other offender level data um, to promote a victim notification system. Uh, once that system is up and running, uh, it should facilitate a very robust um, offender uh, criminal justice data warehouse will be uh, should be the first time pretty much ever on uh, the state of Indiana that everything from arrest data to jail data to DOC data is all found in one place court data to truly um, you know mine that information and make some impact so we can have some uh, informed decisions for everything from EBDM to JRAC to pretrial um, and everything else. As far as CJI's role with JRAC, obviously we work um, on the recommendations and the grant reviews and that kind of stuff, but kind of two of our primary roles are, uh, we're statutorily uh, required to do uh, annually partner with, the, with JRAC to do the criminal code evaluation. Um, we've done, I think we're on our fifth or sixth report now in the last couple of years, as was mentioned earlier, we've partnered with JRAC uh, for those reports. Um, and then also the other portion that we're, we're here to do is help supplement with criminal justice funding that we receive both uh, a little bit at the state level, but predominantly federal level to help promote whatever pretrial efforts or uh, needs the locals to help advance uh, the criminal code reform or justice reinvestment. Devin, thank you for uh, your service, your participation. Uh, I, I know that I really um, appreciated the scope and the, the breadth of the work that you do uh, in preparing for the meeting and going over uh, the, the annual reports from, uh, for, from your organization. Uh, so thank you very much. It's just, it's, it's wonderful work. And uh, over the past year, since JRAC's report went out, but also since the uh, Jail Overcrowding Task Force report went out, I think that there's just going to be uh, some game-changing uh, work that will come out of uh, that, that jail data that you're, you're you're working to help sheriffs collect. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'd next call on Ralph Watson as a designee of ward buyers for the Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Ralph. Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, I am uh, serving currently as past president for the Association of, or of the Community Corrections Act counties. And as you noted, I'm uh, representing ward buyers today. Uh, the Our association, uh, we are looking forward to continuing to participate in, the, in this initiative as we have in the past uh, several years. And we'd, uh, I'd like to welcome new, new uh, members and look forward to working with everyone. And I also want to thank the staff at Indiana Court Services for uh, having the techno working with us on the technology to make this uh, meeting available. Uh, the immediate focus of our association members um, 
is a, on the recently released grant, uh, uh, community corrections grant applications that are due July 17th that Ms. Blessinger uh, spoke of. And so uh, most of our association members are, are spending a great deal of time on that right now. Um, but during this pandemic, we've been working as a group to uh, share methods in which uh, local agencies could overcome some of the challenges uh, we've uh, met in providing intensive supervision and services during the pandemic, whether we were delivering those services in a residential setting or a non-residential setting. Um, and so we've, uh, we've had a lot of communication with that. Our association has had several meetings um, not only our board of directors, but also our executive committee uh, to discuss ways in which we may uh, be able to uh, continue uh, to provide effective and uh, effective supervision and effective services, even though many of our vendors are also challenged to, to provide those services. One of the things that we have been doing is uh, having weekly meetings uh, with uh, various community corrections directors I know that with our residential uh, our residential committee, we've been meeting once a week to share uh, through Zoom meetings to share some of the challenges we're facing and share ideas on how we might come up uh, overcome some of those challenges. Unfortunately, we uh, had to cancel our spring training conference that uh, was scheduled for April, and we are currently discussing the status of our annual training institute that's uh, scheduled for the fall. So we we're uncertain as to uh, what will occur there, but though these are the two primary training uh, events for our association members through the year. So we want to look at um, any option we can have to uh, provide those various training sessions or any training sessions to the members of our association. At this time, I really don't have a, a, a lot more to report, um, but uh, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to do so. Ralph, we're very fortunate to have your participation. It's good to see you again. Thank you for that excellent report. I next call on Adam McQueen, uh, representing uh, Probation Offices Professional Association of Indiana. Adam? Uh, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, I, I would really just to like to start off by welcoming all of the new members of uh, JRAC. Um, I think that if this is your first meeting, um, what you're gonna find is this is a very uh, action-oriented group. Um, so I hope that you all have that takeaway, the same takeaway that I do uh, about this group. Uh, Ralph, uh, Mr. Watson mentioned that their um, fall conference or winter conference is sort of in flux right now. Uh, we actually officially made the decision yesterday to, to cancel the fall conference for the Probation Officers Professional Association of Indiana, commonly referred to as Popeye. Uh, we made that decision yesterday um, and really are continuing to explore uh, ways that we can provide uh, training education to officers across the state and our membership in general um, through a virtual platform. So that's that's something that's um, that's in the works right now. And I hope to have more to report on uh, later down the road. Thank you, Adam. I, I know that uh, we're all dealing with that. Uh, judges have an annual conference that uh, has been postponed the same way and uh, very proud of our education uh, team at the Office of Court Services who really are moving mountains to uh, create really the same thing, a virtual platform. So our judges are up to speed in this time where everything is, uh, is seemingly in flux. So thank you for that report. Uh, thank you for your excellent work. I next would call on Kirsten Haney as uh, for a report from the State Budget Agency. Ms. Haney? Yeah, thanks, uh, Justice Goff. So not a lot to report from State Budget Agency. We've been really busy the last few months analyzing the fiscal impacts of the COVID-19 uh, impact to revenues and how that's affecting all of the state agencies statewide, um, along with gearing up for the next biennium. So we're in the process of working with agencies to start releasing budget instructions because before we know it, legislative session will be here again and we're going to be building the fiscal year 22 and 23 uh, biennium budget. So one of the things we are doing is moving towards a completely online based budget uh, development instruction process. So we're going to be doing everything online or remote just like other state agencies are. 
making sure we provide uh, constant communication and development on those budgets and just using Microsoft Teams. as our platform for everything. Um, that's all we have on our end. Ms. Haney, your uh, audio and video froze for just a second there at the end. I want to make sure that there was something in the last uh, 10 or 15 seconds of your statement that uh, we, we didn't miss. Sorry about that. No, just that we don't have a lot on our end to share. We appreciate being involved and we'll definitely be keeping everyone updated as um, we get closer to legislative session and budget development. We're, we're very grateful for your involvement and uh, we, we're going to do everything we can to be good partners uh, through all of this. So thank you very much for your report and, and your uh, participation today. Thanks so much. I next call on David Botwarf from the Association of Indiana Counties. Sure. Thanks. Uh, again, Dave Follows, Executive Director of the Association of Indiana Counties. Uh, my first meeting. I appreciate uh, the committee endorsing legislation that allows us to be on this committee. We've been involved with EBDM in the past and, of course, uh, Jail Overcrowding Task Force, which, again, has been incorporated into this into this group, the objectives of that. And um, I just want to thank the court uh, for the leadership they've provided on these efforts. I talked to my counterparts across the country, and I think because of the leadership of uh, the Chief Justice and court administration, we are um, at the forefront nationally on some of these reform efforts, and I think it's showing, and uh, I think we're making great progress. I mean, the report from Mental Health uh, at FSSA today was outstanding to know that we're making progress on getting services into the jail, and of course, this COVID situation has slowed that down because um, we're not having people coming to the jail as much to, to do these kind of services, but we're making such great progress. And it's hard to think about what our priorities were more than three months ago, but it was definitely jail overcrowding. The level six uh, issue was a big issue for us and the, and the distribution formula for how counties are being reimbursed for level six. But uh, with the pandemic, of course, all that um, sort of slowed down and, uh, our members are very intrigued about the reasons why the jail uh, jail population is down 20, 25%. Again, I think it's because of the leadership of um, the court in this group. So we're definitely interested in trying to, what, what can we do to keep that jail population down once um, we get back in full swing, uh, the courts having hearings and so forth. But obviously some of it's pandemic related, but others is, again, I think the reforms that this committee has pushed through uh, so, again, very excited to participate in this. And the last three months, we've really just been focused on CARES Act funding, trying to make sure that uh, counties, uh, public defenders, prosecutors, judges, court employees knew the best way to go about getting PPE equipment into how to make the courts as safe as possible when they reopen. And, um, you know, the video conferencing that the courts have adopted, um, if there had been reluctance on that, Previously, I think people are were forced to become more comfortable with that, and we definitely hope that that continues in the future, and um, we think we will. And so, uh, again, we've just really been focusing on CARES Act funding and making sure that counties take advantage of FEMA reimbursement, CARES Act money, the money that's become available to the Criminal Justice Institute and through FSSA, Division of Mental Health. So, uh, again, just excited to be part of the committee. I hope we can be a contributor um, to this committee because they've done such great work the last several years. And um, that's really the report I have right now. And um, we'll continue to share with the court and others as we learn about uh, proper reimbursement um, through the CARES Act money through IFA as we get more solid answers on what's reimbursable. We'll definitely share that with the, with the group so that we make sure that we take advantage of it. it's available to us to protect uh, the courts, court employees, and, and the customers who use the courts. Well, David, thank you for your participation and your service throughout, um, especially the last several months. I've had the privilege of participating in a weekly phone call with you and uh, several other uh, council members uh, through the course of the pandemic and the information that you brought to the stakeholder group 
uh, was invaluable uh, in much the same way as uh, Dr. Doss provided medical guidelines, your guidance on uh, being able to obtain PPE for especially those counties that might not have had access to it, I, I think genuinely saved lives. And so we, we appreciate your service in that regard and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thanks. I next call on Judge Mark Spitzer on behalf of the Indiana Judges Association. All right, thank you, um, Justice Goff. And uh, I'm a new member um, of JRAC, um, representing the, uh, as Justice Goff said, the uh, Judges Association. With regards to the activities of the Judges Association, um, primary focus lately has been on supporting um, judges and courts uh, as they navigate the COVID um, crisis. Um, and also um, uh, assisting in um, preparing our administrative rule 17 reports to um, the Supreme Court and crafting those plans to um, eventually and ultimately get back to somewhat business as, um, as usual in the future, um, we all hope. Um, and in addition, um, currently the Judges Association is also um, looking at the Chief Justice's statement on race and equity. Um, and uh, collecting information to help inform future educational opportunities for the judges um, as, as um, um, we look at um, you know, a response um, and a follow-up to the Chief Justice's statement. Um, so those are uh, kind of the, the topical things that we're working on now. I think um, what, what I bring to, the, um, to JRAC, and it sounds weird for a, a new member is some institutional knowledge. Um, I'm the judge of Grant Circuit Court uh, in Grant County. Um, and um, I also uh, preside over the dr a drug court and a veterans court there. So I'm used to using evidence-based practices on the front line. Um, what you may not know is Grant County was the first, uh, uh, the, the evidence-based decision-making initiative uh, started in Grant County um, when in 2010, we decided we'd apply to um, the National Institution of Corrections um, new initiative at that time um, to, uh, and, and, and became one of seven um, jurisdictions, seven counties in the United States um, to participate in that initiative at a local level. That grew to the state level EBDM initiative. Um, and I've been on the state team, been fortunate to serve on the state team um, since um, its inception. And, and have gotten to know many of you. There's many familiar faces to me um, today. And so we've worked together and actually accomplished quite a bit. Um, I'm currently uh, chairing the pretrial uh, committee. Um, and so we've, we've um, I think you've heard a little bit about from uh, Mary Kay about uh, the fact that we are up and, and operating and implemented with uh, not just pilot counties um, on pretrial, but now um, other counties have uh, jumped on board as well. I received an an email yesterday um, from a judge in a county that's getting ready to uh, get their uh, county certified um, for, uh, for pre-trial. Um, ABDM is not just pre-trial. Um, there are really four principles underlying um, the EBDM, initi EBDM initiative. And the first one is that the professional judgment of cr criminal justice system decision makers is enhanced when informed by evidence-based knowledge. So in implementing evidence-based knowledge into um, that frontline work. Um, the second is that every interaction within the criminal justice system offers an opportunity to contribute to harm reduction and um, to uh, enhance behavior change. Um, and so that means um, it's to some extent a kinder, gentler, more responsive criminal justice system um, that meets people where they are and helps facilitate their behavior change. I think that's very um, consistent with the Chief Justice's statement on race and equity. The third principle is that systems achieve better outcome when they operate collaboratively, and that's why we're all here, um, collaborative decision making. And then the, the other one is that we, we as a system will continually learn and improve when we make decisions based upon the collection and use of data. So um, I think JRAC is, is well structured to support all of those um, core principles of the EBDM process. I'm really excited to be um, a member of the group and, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate in this process. Judge Spitzer, uh, 
my, my longtime friend and my old neighbor, uh, I served in a county just immediately north of his. And I can tell you that when I wanted to do something the right way, uh, I, I would call Mark Spitzer, one of his colleagues in Grant County. You have truly been a pioneer in this uh, area. And so we're very fortunate to have your participation as a council member. Thank you for your service, Judge Spitzer. I would now call on Mr. Mark Rutherford for a report on behalf of the Indiana Public Defender Commission. Thank you, Mark? Justice Goff. I'm Mark Rutherford, Chair of the Indiana Public Defender Commission. As you see on your share screen, nice little display there, sort of about what we are about. Basically, we're an opt-in program for counties to be reimbursed for their public defense costs. Um, there are strictures behind that, of course, but if they agree to follow our guidelines and standards for indigent defense services, which include maximum caseloads and some uh, uh, case specific training requirements, then they can be reimbursed for up to 40% for their non capital felony juvenile chins expenses and, and uh, payroll costs. 50% uh, in capital cases, death penalty cases, were not allowed by the legislature to reimburse by a for adult misdemeanors. Um, but we are very proud of the fact that over 97 cents of every dollar that the General Assembly graciously applies for us to be able to do this and help over 50 counties with their indigent defense services uh, goes directly to the public defender reimbursement of those costs and expenses. Um, we have lots of priorities uh, on here. Uh, you can read them if you'd like, but I'd like to bring up two different things but uh, one is a very recent thing that just happened to show what the commission is doing and what I believe personally is doing well. And that is we had our meeting last Wednesday and uh, we had a, a, a report and it was the public defender workload study. The commission uh, uh, engaged American Bar Association Standing Committee on Legal Aid and Incident Defendants and Crow LLC to work together to analyze the uh, public uh, defender system, but more specifically, the workloads of public defenders in Indiana. Why is that so important? Why is that very important to Public Defender Commission? Is that over the years, uh, since our creation many de uh, several, many years ago, um, we, uh, we are looking to see what is actually going on out there. And we even have to the point of one of our employees does research and statistic analysis and he's a PhD. Uh, he, he's great. Um, and, and because he's committed to us, we can get him at a very good price. Um, the purpose of that, though, is to know what is happening, what's going on. We got the report, we're analyzing it, but it gives us information about really what's happening. Our standards, uh, are they realistic? Do they need to change? Are we missing something? But one thing that we have learned in our research and our statistics analysis and we're getting closer to why it is and answer questions. In fact, we, I, I was confident enough to tell the General Assembly about it uh, uh, at the last budget uh, hearings uh, or, or before the, the chambers uh, committees um, that we're seeing where counties are in our program, recidivism is generally going down. Why that is, we can talk about that a lot. We're trying to factually and by statistics and looking at the facts to determine what it is. We have lots of ideas on why it is, but what we do know is that is the case where commission counties who have opted in are seeing a redu re reduced recidivism. Some of our theories include that when you have people who are adequately compensated, you're able to hire enough people to have the time to work with the defendants, they can then talk to the prosecutors and judges in an annoying fashion on if there's a conviction and a sentence, what will work to cause that person not to come back to the system. It's not foolproof, of course, and that's one of the theories we're looking at. We're trying to figure out if we can do this in, in, a, in a way with uh, statistics, et cetera, to show why it's happening and what is happening. But I'm very proud of the commission. I'm very proud that we're a part of this now, and I really look forward to working with everybody. Mark, we're all pleased that you're serving, and I can tell you as a former public defender in a county that did not participate, and then as a trial court judge uh, in a community that um, took advantage of the program, uh, this really does help. It, it was our experience that this broadened our pool of attorneys. 
Um, one of my first experiences on the Supreme Court was to participate in the task force on public defense. And I'm, I'm hopeful that some of the areas uh, that Indiana could, could uh, probably easily improve upon are some items that we might look to in the coming months and, and, and really have a good discussion and uh, incre increase public awareness of some of these issues. I think that they're very important and they can really have, as you say, a tremendous effect on recidivism. So thank you for your, your participation. Thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. My next call uh, on, and I'm, I'm not sure that we ended up having a call in, is, is there anyone here to speak on behalf of the Senate Corrections and Criminal Law Committee? Justice Goff, I don't believe um, Senator Young was able to join, but Senator Tallian was going to. Senator Tallian, are you on? Okay, thank you. All right. Well, uh, April, thank you for that. And uh, as with the uh, Sheriff's Association, if uh, either of the senators uh, uh, is able to call in, please let me know. I wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to address the council. I, uh, I, I do know that there is uh, at least one member, uh, the chair of the House Court and Criminal Code Committee. And so I would now uh, invite uh, comments from Representative Wendy McNamara. Representative McNamara. Did we lose Representative McNamara? Um, I believe she was trying to call in by phone and got disconnected. Can you hear that? No, that doesn't work. There we go. Can you guys hear me on my yeah. computer? Yes, we can hear you. Representative McNamara? Okay. I can't hear myself, so um, I'm glad you can hear me, but I'm just going to talk because I can't hear you guys, but I heard a faint, yes, we hear you. <laughs> so... Uh, just real quick, um, we have really three things that we're going to look at this fall. Expect to have uh, committee hearings in September. I think I'll have two in September and one in October, and then those will be done before the final reports in November. But uh, one is looking at the uh, efficacy and impact of defining consent for sexual encounters. Uh, that was uh, a bill by Representative Arrington and Representative Nagel, uh, and then myself and Representative Cat, uh, Tallian, and uh, I think Representative, sorry, Senator Tallian, Representative Cannibal also signed letters. So um, yeah, I might be able to start my video, see what happens. Does that help or make a difference? Can you hear us, Representative McNamara? Can you hear us now, ma'am? I can't hear. I can't hear you. Um, I'm not sure what else to do. Well, but, I, I'm not. We can. We can hear you. If, you, if you're well, able to hear me, please. That's good continue. then. <laughs> All right, and then the other. Um, two things. One is the uh, multi-year review of um, current trends with respect to criminal behavior, sentencing, incarceration, and treatment as related to HEA 1006 from 2014 and 2015. And then we will revisit again, which was an interim study topic last year, um, criminal laws concerning fraud and deception. Uh, Senator Young is trying to make them a little bit more streamlined. Um, so we're going to take another stab at that and see what, what happens. So um, I apologize, I can't hear you. And if I could, I get feedback through my phone, but I'm glad you could hear me. And thank you for um, having the opportunity to talk. Thank you for your participation and thank you for your service, Representative McNamara. Thank you. Um, 
I don't believe that we have, uh, I don't believe that Representative Hatcher was able to connect today, but um, Representative Hatcher, are you, if I'm mistaken about that, uh, we would uh, welcome a report from you as well, ma'am. Very well. Um, and then uh, last but certainly not least, I would uh, ask for uh, Mr. Doug Hunsinger to make a report uh, on behalf of the governor. Doug? Well, thank you, Justice Goff, and uh, I'm very pleased to join the council. Uh, I'm Doug Hunsinger, and I serve as the executive director for drug prevention, treatment, and enforcement, uh, and chairman of the Indiana Commission to Combat Drug Abuse. Uh, as a senior advisor to the governor and a member of his cabinet, uh, I'm charged with coordinating the state's response to the drug epidemic. So I'd like to start by thanking uh, Becky Buner and her team at DMHA. Uh, they've been tirelessly working around the clock to ensure access to substance use disorder treatment and recovery uh, services to ensure that they're preserved during this time. Uh, I'd also like to commend her team. Uh, they were able to open two opioid treatment programs during the shutdown, and they were able to connect the providers with the DEA and the pharmacy board uh, to get those final approvals needed to open uh, while both agencies were uh, shut down and on um, uh, travel restrictions. So this moves us closer to our goal of having every Hoosier uh, within an hour's drive of one of these treatment providers. For <clears throat> those with substance use disorder, uh, this can be an especially scary time uh, as it's easy to feel disconnected. And so I I'd like for everyone to consider the following. Uh, Indiana Statewide 211 Call Center previously received approximately 1,100 calls on a busy day. Uh, it's now averaging over 25,000 calls. We've seen a 35% increase in the administration of naloxone by emergency medical services, and our emergency departments have seen a 54% increase in overdose events so far this year. Uh, so we're not waiting uh, for everything to open back up to react. Uh, last month, Governor Holcomb announced a partnership with Overdose Lifeline uh, to distribute 25,000 naloxone kits for Hoosiers. And that's totaling about a million dollars from our state opioid uh, response grant that we received from SAMHSA. So anyone that would like to receive a supply of naloxone can fill out a request form at overdoselifeline.org. Uh, I do wanna point out that there are, uh, that we're continuing to see a decline in our overdose death rate. Um, this is encouraging news that we're on the right track and our naloxone availability is working to save lives. In conjunction with this announcement, uh, Indiana Medicaid has received approval from CMS that will allow for full reimbursement for emergency medical responders who administer naloxone. And when this takes effect on July 1st, Indiana will become the first state uh, to pay EMS providers for both the administration of the drug and the medication itself. I'm actually really excited. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be announcing our uh, peer recovery regional anchor sites. Uh, and this is a partnership with Indiana 211 and Mental Health America Indiana. Uh, this will make peer recovery coaches accessible via five regional networks. So look forward to uh, an announcement um, coming up um, here in the next, next month or so. Uh, this week, the governor and I met with Jim Carroll, who's the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And we discussed some of the uh, policy changes the federal government has made uh, during the time of COVID and how we'd like to see them become permanent. Uh, we'll continue to have these conversations with our federal partners to ensure that our lessons learned uh, during this time continue. So our recovery process is, on, is going to be incredibly critical for individuals moving forward, and the combating the drug epidemic continues to be a priority of our administration. So while we've made progress, we know there's still much to do. So I wanna thank all of you for your partnership and all that you do to make our state a better place for all Hoosiers. So Justice Goff, I'll pass it back to you. Doug, thank you for that excellent report. I always have a difficult time keeping up with just everything that you all have been able to do to make Indiana better. Uh, I, I wanna personally thank you for uh, your work in collaboration, not only with uh, substance abuse in general, but as Mary Kay alluded to earlier, uh, with uh, your work in the governor's uh, generosity with uh, funding the expansion of our family recovery courts. Uh, in, in just over a, a year time, uh, we've been able to nearly triple uh, the number of those programs in Indiana. And uh, when all said and done, uh, probably more than half of uh, 
Indiana's children involved in the child welfare system would have access to that and they, they wouldn't have, uh, but for uh, your, your willingness to partner with uh, the judiciary. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for your continued service. We're, we're glad you're here with us. <clears throat> Since uh, I think we've got the technical uh, difficulties uh, taken care of and I, I see that uh, Steve Luce uh, has joined us and I, I would invite you Steve to make a report on behalf of the Indiana Sheriff's Association. Thank you, Justice Goff, and uh, apologize for this, but uh, we are currently um, in the process of moving our office out to Hendricks County in Avon. So uh, we'll be uh, residents out there. Uh, the Indiana Pacers bought the building we were in and we had till July 1st to get out, then they extended it, but we would have to move anyway. We found a great piece of property. And um, actually we start working here full time next week. So we're in transition of internets and things like that. So um, first uh, on the COVID thing, I, I think, uh, you know, not to be a um, uh, duplicate on a lot of things, but the sheriffs, I will tell you, uh, if I had to give them a grade in how we went about uh, mitigating the COVID-19, I would literally give them an A, A plus, because uh, when you look at 92 sheriff offices in the jails, uh, I think there was a combined roughly 150 cases about three or four weeks ago. It's kind of slimmed down a little bit. But when you consider that 85% uh, of those, 90% of those were in about five facilities, uh, the rest of the sheriffs had either zero or one. And you know that truly is an amazing feat when you uh, saw the numbers went down. But the hardest thing was probably try to make sure the staff, um, that they were tested and that they weren't bringing it in and out because that's where the, the issue probably uh, really was. But uh, we were able to provide uh, over 20,000 PPE masks to all the sheriff's offices. Um, we were able to secure that. Um, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, I actually was on the call with uh, the CDC um, top officials when they were writing their guidelines for jails. Um, they, uh, they had the prison manual, but as we know, jails and prisons do operate different. So my role for the National Sheriff's Association was just to um, really represent the rural county jails and what we see as challenges as opposed to the large city jails. Um, we also had weekly calls with the state Supreme Court, a lot of the uh, partners that are already on here. I think we found out there's a lot of great communication going on. Um, the sheriffs, uh, we involved uh, probably about a half a dozen sheriffs on the calls throughout the weeks. Uh, they were very beneficial to everybody. And I, I really believe the, uh, the whole key was that communication piece. And uh, we were able to uh, really um, dial down on, on how uh, we as uh, stakeholders need to continue to operate even after this pandemic hopefully lifts. But uh, to see the population of the jails down, uh, from what my understanding is, and their self-reported numbers to DOC, nearly 5,000 uh, offenders. We know that just because of COVID, some of the counties by default really had to start looking at the numbers and who is in jail. So we really need to encourage that practice to continue. Uh, one of the things we talked about too in a later conversation was when COVID does um, maybe slow down somewhat, I, we know that there's some uh, um, high volume warrants in some counties. And if we can just maybe look at that again and maybe uh, look at with work with the prosecutor's office and the judges and see how many, as opposed to dumping the warrant file, maybe we can look at the um, assigning uh, summonses to some of those um, um, offenders as opposed to just putting a warrant out there. So um, along with um, the COVID thing, uh, now we are, um, we had uh, a, couple, a meeting uh, with a uh, partnership with uh, Doug Hunsinger of the governor's office and Becky Buner uh, and myself and our legal deputy. About uh, two weeks ago, we had a kickoff meeting with the state opioid grant. I think everybody knows that the ISA has been uh, awarded that and we are working with them and all our uh, community partners and the sheriffs to provide uh, expanding MAT in their jails and also evidence-based uh, uh, jail treatment. So um, that is um, um, going on right now. We've got a lot of uh, people reaching out to us and we are 
our role as the ISA is to do the reimbursement. At the same time, we are working with each county on a uh, business agreement to where once it's completed, there will be no uh, medical information passed on for billing. It's just a blind billing, for example, Boone County Offender One, and it'll give the services that for reimbursement. So we feel pretty good about that. And we're going to be moving forward with that. Um, I think the biggest thing that I, I cannot wait for, and Devin touched on it a little bit, was the involvement of the, uh, there's going to be a new statewide victim RFP. And without, um, you, you cannot have a victim notification system without having uh, jail management um, release information and intake information. And we are also going to do a second RFP on a data jail data transmission uh, portal. Uh, so hopefully within the next year and a half, uh, we will have a, a, a system of uh, real-time jail data. And as um, Devin talked, because of the legislation, I believe that uh, RFP will be moving rather quickly too. And I think once it's completed, I, I really believe that we're going to be able to identify um, um, and work smarter, not harder, as we have in the last few years. Uh, it's, it's gonna be uh, just an awesome tool for everybody on the phone call. Um, and then of course, the, the Indiana Sheriff's Association, we have been working with uh, Jay Chaudhry, uh, and I was on when you mentioned your trip to Logansport, uh, and we really want to continue to work and partner with the mental health issues uh, on the forensic side uh, to try and um, find some space there. And as David Bodorf uh, talked, one of the priorities too is to maybe review the level six funding for the counties. Um, so, you know, kind of a condensed version, a lot going on, but we appreciate um, everybody here and what they're doing. And uh, I can't say enough, I've been with the group from the uh, original date and uh, JRAC has really done some awesome things. And I, I look forward to where we go down the road in the future. Thank you. Steve, um, it's just really been a pleasure serving with you throughout this and to see what your group ha has done uh, to keep people safe and to really exercise leadership in your communities and uh, give us some information so that we can make the best possible decisions under uh, just the most incredible and, and difficult circumstances. So thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you. I. Um, if there's anybody else who's joined the call that I, I did not uh, call on or, or, or missed the original call, I want to give you an opportunity to speak now. I, I don't think that there is, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, make that offer. Uh, we're now at that point in the agenda, uh, item six, next steps. And uh, you know, it, it takes a long time to get through a meeting like this. And uh, in anticipation of today's meeting, I spent some time this morning, as did Mary Kay, speaking with Chief Justice Rush about sort of this moment in time we find ourselves in where we have this incredible confluence of uh, the public health crisis, which led to depopulating the jail and then uh, the, the, the outcry uh, for racial justice that Bernice spoke uh, so eloquently about and was uh, really given as kind of an action item by the, the Black Caucus. And, you know, when I, I heard from Representative McNamara and she indicated really this very ambitious uh, legislative agenda, it seems to me that we probably need to be in contact with each other uh, more frequently than once every couple of months, uh, or we're liable to miss an opportunity uh, to, to help some people out and to really do some good things. So I don't want to uh, monopolize this conversation, but I would like to recap a little bit of what I heard um, as to the, the legislative agenda that we heard Representative McNamara, uh, she's looking at dates in September and October. Our next meeting is not until September. So it strikes me that we'll need to uh, be really contacting council members about smaller working groups uh, and we're going to need to identify some items that we think might be of uh, common interest and, uh, and really move forward on. The, in that vein, the chief asked me to really talk to this group about low-hanging fruit. 
you know, having gone through that jail overcrowding process, uh, having gone through uh, so much with respect to opioids over the past several years. And um, really, I, I think that there are a lot of items we could identify. Uh, so I, I think that those are some things that I think it's important for us to talk about. And um, in our conversations, as we, you know, maybe talk about some really deep uh, structural improvements, I, I would like to see us focus on some things like uh, state and local partnership. Uh, what can we do to strengthen our state and local partnerships and build upon some of the progress that we've made? And then, you know, on today of all days, I, I really, I think it's probably incumbent upon me, the, the first member we heard of was, was from today was Bernice Corley. And uh, she had talked about the importance of uh, addressing uh, racial inequity and uh, really how well suited a group like this is to, uh, to talk about and address those things. So I, I, I guess maybe in the time we have left, I, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't at least uh, suggest that as possibly the, the, the most perfect uh, first action item I, I could ask this group to address is, um, is there a consensus or will the group that we could uh, form a, a, a working group on uh, racial uh, inequity uh, and, and really uh, do some conversations, some talking before the next meeting. I, I know that I would be in favor of such a such a proposal. Now, ISA would. Can I just ask then? Uh, if, is there any further discussion on that? And if not, I would I would like to uh, make a motion that we form a working group uh, to address uh, racial inequality in uh, Indiana's justice system. Justice, this is Steve Luce. Um, I just want to make a comment that yesterday we had a very productive phone call with uh, Representative Sturwald on uh, policing and 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 how, you know reform, and uh, we did have a couple members of the Black Caucus on there, and we're going to continue our discussions. We also pulled in a couple chiefs uh, from larger cities, so our discussions have already started, and we'd be happy to help. Uh, with the continued discussion uh, through our Sheriff's Association. That's outstanding. Thank you, as always, Steve. <laughs> Justice Golf, this is Chris Blessinger. Um, definitely agree with that and would, you know, be willing to help out in any way. Wonderful. I don't know if you were looking for a second to your motion, Justice Golf, but I'll second it. <laughs> Judge Spitzer, thank you. Well, we now have a motion and we have a second. There's no further discussion then, I would put the uh, question to the group. All those in favor of forming a, a work group under the Indiana Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council uh, addressing topics of racial inequality, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously by this uh, multidisciplinary group of stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Good day for Indiana. Um, you know, I, I, I really um, also want to address uh, just all of this is so interrelated. And it strikes me when we have these conversations that, and, and part of it is because I know some of you, I know most of you so well, but there is so much that we agree on, so many things that we have in common, so many things that we can build upon uh, to make things better for Indiana. And I, I don't want to lose that momentum. I, I wanna to indicate to you that uh, I'm gonna be a bit of a nuisance the next several months, uh, because I think that we've done so many good things uh, in the context of these uh, task force reports, uh, that the, not only from JRAC, but from the, uh, the, the, the uh, Jail Overcrowding Task Force as well, uh, the Opioid Task Force, and really in this issue of mental health uh, and, and how it ties into addiction, that I, I really want to uh, build on the momentum. And, uh, you know, Sheriff uh, Association uh, Director Luce mentioned, uh, and the chief, you know, mentioned to me this morning in anticipation of this, we don't want to run into a situation where we snap back uh, too soon uh, to, to the way everything was. If we were able to, um, you know, decrease the population uh, over a short period of time, I think it's incumbent upon us to really have a discussion about what steps we can take uh, to keep that population under control. What uh, small changes could we make to our practices to really 
uh, keep things from uh, getting uh, overpopulated uh, again. And I really think we've got uh, a possibility and, and an opportunity here to, to do some good. Uh, and so th that's really another item that I, I think I'd like to, to talk to you about. And then the last thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet, is um, I, I really want to make sure that we have an opportunity to engage with our legislative members in a meaningful fashion so that uh, all of the good work that comes out of the various stakeholder groups is something that we can share. Um, you know, when I was a small town judge, I had the luxury of just uh, having a conversation with a few people. And now in this role, it's just much more difficult to keep track of all of the good work that's going on and, and lose some of the progress that's made. Set the challenge from me to uh, really uh, get busy with this work and uh, spend some time in conversation with each other about what uh, things we have in common uh, and about what momentum uh, we can build upon to really uh, get some good things done for Indiana. Thank you. Um, we are at uh, just 10 after three and we're scheduled to go to 3.30. I uh, have, have kind of spoken uh, my mind Congressman, as, uh, as to what I, I think is important uh, and, and what I had uh, in mind to address as we went through and we heard from the different stakeholders. But I, I'd like to take this opportunity then to really uh, open this up uh, for any additional comments from many stakeholder members and then any other business that uh, you'd like to bring to the council before we, uh, before we adjourn. And uh, if you'd like, maybe it would be easier if I just went through the list again of our constituent members. So uh, I'd first ask uh, for any additional comments from uh, Bernice Corley. I have nothing additional, thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Chris, Chris Naylor. Uh, Justice, uh, I can tell you, I and prosecutors uh, would would support kind of those four uh, priorities that you laid out, and uh, also hope to share your optimism uh, in our ability in this state, uh, given the good work we've done together, uh, to be a, a national leader on these issues. So, thank you. Fully really support what you've said. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, next call from uh, Becky Buner. Uh, yes, no, nothing additional from us. Thank you very much. Okay. Steve Luce. Um, thank you, Justice Goff. You know, the only thing is, you know, everything is so important we're talking about is, and I know the uh, the mental health issue in the jails is, is something that the sheriffs really want to dial down on over the next couple of years. So uh, we appreciate the support. Thank you. Chris Blessinger. Um, nothing further here. Just I agree with everything and ready to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Kay Hudson. Uh, thank you, Justice Goff. I think um, thinking about the point that you made and Steve and others have made about the jail populations and how we've seen a significant decrease and we'd like to do to take efforts to sustain that change. Um, I think you know there's there's maybe some things that we could do in the short term to try to address um, you know, counties taking a look at their practices in these times to see what they can continue or um, how they may even and enhance some of their local efforts. And then alongside, so that we're, so that we're sort of addressing the issue in the moment um, before we see things swinging back in the, in the other direction. Um, and that's in the short term. And then the, in the longer term, you know, the jail overcrowding task force and the bail and pretrial reports really were designed to address the jail overcrowding issue long-term. Um, and I think those reports also shore up other areas of the system um, in terms of the recommendations with behavioral health and access to defense counsel and case processing issues and community supervision. So, um, you know, I would propose a consideration of establishing a smaller group consistent with the, the new duties of JRAC um, to look specifically at those issues short term and long term. And perhaps between now and the time um, that this group convenes again, there can be some recommendations developed, whether that's for legislative changes or for some policy guidance or, or technical assistance this, 
this body can offer local jurisdictions as they're trying to navigate coming through the crisis and coming out of the, the crisis. So that's just a, a thought and a suggestion, um, something we can act on now that will that will um, further the objectives of, of JRAC as a whole. I think that's an excellent idea. Are you putting that forward as an action item? Um, yes, sir, I am. And I would be happy to take the lead on coordinating that if, if that's the will of the group. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would put that up uh, then uh, as a, a formal motion made by Mary Kay uh, as sort of a quick response team uh, to address some of these low hanging fruit issues. So she's got her motion before the council. Uh, is, there, uh, is there a second? So the second, Ralph Watson. Is there any further discussion before I call for the question? All those in favor of forming a quick response group, uh, work group, uh, as suggested by Mary Kay Hudson uh, as executive director of the Indiana Office of Court Services, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you very much as always, Mary Kay. Um, Justice Goff, may I let the members know that I may be soliciting participants in the quick response team? As you're forewarned all, uh, you're <laughs> going to be given some homework and yes, yes thank you. Thank you. Um, I next call on Devin McDonald on behalf of the Criminal Justice Institute. Devin? Justice Devin McDonald had to step away for another meeting um, and will view the video later for anything he might have missed. Thank you very much, April. Ralph Watson on behalf of the Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Justice Scott, thank you. I don't have anything uh, else to add. Um, I really uh, I think everyone's had some great ideas and appreciate uh, Mary Sue's, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary Kay's uh, suggestions. Thank you again, Ralph. Adam McQueen, Popeye. Justice Goff, thank you. Um, there was a lot of good information shared today, uh, Public Defenders Commission, DMHA. I wondered if, uh, number one, if that couldn't be made available, the handouts that were used during today's presentation um, to this group, but also uh, the public in general. I think having um, information like that, it, maybe even in advance of these meetings, would be something that a, a, would be a very helpful thing. So, to, I'm sure we can accommodate that. Okay. Adam, while I have you here, and Ralph and Mary Kay, uh, if I speak out of tune, uh, on, I turn on this. You know, in the discussion earlier about lack of training due to COVID, I, I wonder whether or not, as we um, look for ways to really keep things from snapping back, whether it might be incumbent upon us to try and look for ways to really facilitate some uniform training uh, for community corrections and for probation on how to keep things uh, from, from overpopulating uh, too quickly. Uh, you know, some of the practices that we learned, uh, and, and I know a lot of that is going on, but if you, uh, either of you received a call from our staff about the possibility of uh, taking some leadership and in, in developing and implementing training like that, would, would you be interested? Oh, definitely, would, would love to help with something like that. Yes, uh, yes, I happily support that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kirsten Haney, anything further uh, on budget matters, ma'am? Nope, nothing on my end. Thank you. Thank you again for your participation. David Batorf, Association of Indiana Counties. Yeah, um, a little bit of a related issue, and I hope not to step on anybody's toes when I suggest maybe this group should look at this. Um, we've, of course, been following the federal legislative, federal case on opioid litigation. And we don't know if there'll be a settlement. I mean, not asking this group to advocate one way or another. I didn't know if this group would be a good body to start to think about if there is a settlement or an award, how the state may want to allocate that money. What do we want to use it for in a kind of cohesive group? Because I'm sure everybody will come to the table when that's announced. And ultimately, I guess it'll be the General Assembly's decision. Um, but I didn't know if this group should focus on that a little bit to say if money becomes available, we think the best use would be, you know, the mental, mental health organization, the, the MAP program they're doing. If that's too far out 
um, for this group to think about, I understand, but I just think that potentially that money may become available. It'd be nice if we had a plan on how to use that. A recommendation, at least on this committee. Uh, David, as always, I appreciate your participation because uh, you come from a silo that is so much different uh, than, than uh, most of our, our silos that uh, you really uh, think of some topics that I'd not considered. So I, I, I expect if you're willing, sir, we would like to reach out to you uh, between now and the next meeting to, to kind of get more of those ideas so that we are certain that we're missing uh, absolutely as little as possible as we go through and we look at some of these larger issues. I think that's an excellent idea. I don't know the answer to it, but I, I don't want to miss an opportunity like that if it's presented. Thank you. Okay. Judge Spitzer, anything further on behalf of the Judges Association? No, nothing further. I, I would just say that I'm willing to serve on any subcommittees that uh, the chair feels that I'm uh, appropriate to serve on. And so um, I'll wait for an, an assignment. Well, you're getting homework, Judge. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Mark Rutherford, behalf of the Public Defender Commission. Uh, nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you again for your participation, Mark. Uh, Representative McNamara, anything further, ma'am? Okay. Uh, Doug Hunsinger, anything further on behalf of the governor? Uh, thank you. No, no further comments. Thank you again for all you do, Doug. Well, uh, Hearing nothing else, uh, I, I'm terribly excited. Uh, you know, in, in, in many ways, this year has been one of the most challenging years I, I certainly can remember. But I can tell you that I uh, really feel that a group like this is up to uh, some of the tasks that we've identified. In, in fact, I think Indiana is, is really well positioned uh, to come out of these challenges better and stronger. And um, I, I, I believe that to my core because I've had the opportunity to work with so many of you and so many of your colleagues. I, I know your hearts. I know your willingness and dedication to serving others. And it's my great honor uh, to be able to do this work with you. So um, for now, Goodbye, friends. Uh, you'll be hearing from us, and uh, we're, we're going to be doing what we can to, uh, to make Indiana a better place. So we stand adjourned. Thank you.